morning, everybody. Good to be back in the committee room. Feels like home. Um, my name is Lou Fiddler. I'm the uh, chair chairperson of the uh, New Services Committee. Annabelle Palmer is the chair of the uh, General Welfare Committee. And I'm uh, pleased to uh, have everyone here today uh, uh, for a joint uh, committee meeting. I'm sure a number of members have been milling around. We have a lot of a lot of committee meetings today. Uh, because we had uh, the recess for President's Week, so everything got crammed into the same space. Uh, today we will discuss uh, proposed introduction number 866A, a local law in relation to the reporting of data regarding sexually exploited children. Sexually exploited children are young people who have been forced to trade sex or sexual acts for money, food, clothing, or a place to stay. These children face a daily threat of rape, robberies, and beatings by clients and pimps, as well as exposure to sexually transmitted diseases. Approximately two-thirds of these children suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. In addition, many of these young people have been thrown out of their homes or been forced to run away to escape abuse. A 2008 study found that of the approximately 4,000 young people who are homeless every night in New York City, 150 admit to spending their nights engaged in sex work. A 2007 study conducted by the New York State Office of Children and Family Services found that all of the commercially exploited girls in OCFS custody had run away from home at least once, and 95% had a prior history of abuse or neglect. In New York City, DYCD is responsible for providing housing and services for runaway and homeless youth through drop-in centers, crisis shelters, and transitional independent living centers. DYCD funds one transitional, transitional independent living center, GEMS, which specializes in residential treatment for women and girls who have been victims of commercial sexual exploitation. The GEMS till has only eight beds available. In 2008, 42 young people in DYCD crisis shelters identified themselves as victims of sexual exploitation. It is important for us as a city to meet the needs of young people who have been the victims of sexual exploitation. In order to provide the appropriate num uh, number of beds and services for sexually exploited children, we need to know how many of these children come into contact with our city agencies and the demographic breakdown of this group. One example of why this information is important is the lack of specialized services for young men who are sexually exploited. Studies have found that, uh, studies have found that make, I'm sorry, males account for a significant portion of sexually exploited youth in New York City. However, there are no currently specialized beds or services for this population. And you know, I say that knowing that every one of our drop-in crisis shelters, till programs, has to deal with sexually exploited children on a daily basis. They are all equipped, but none of them uh, specialize uh, in that specifically. If enacted, proposed intro number 866A would require DYCD and the Administration for Children's Services to report on the number of youth in contact with either agency who have been victims of sexual exploitation. The agencies would also have to report on beds and services which are available to the population. I look forward to hearing from DYCD, ACS, and advocates regarding proposed intro number 866A. I am hopeful that we can work together to provide necessary services and improve the lives of sexually exploited youth in New York City. And as I've said many, many times before, in, in this day and age, in the greatest city in the world, uh, allowing uh, children to be sexually exploited, to sleep on the streets is just not acceptable. Uh, we have to be able to do better. Um, with that, I see we've been joined by Councilmember Rodriguez. I turn it over to my co-chair, Annabelle Palmer. Thank you, Councilmember Lewin. Thank you for your work you've done on, on this topic and the work that you do on behalf of the youth of the City of New York. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councilmember Annabelle Palma, and I chair the New York City General Warfare Committee, and I want to welcome everyone who's here today and interested in this topic. And before I, I read my testimony, I want to thank the committee staff who prepared for today's hearing, Andrea Vasquez, Liz Hoffman, General, Jennifer Wilcox, and Michael Benjamin. Thank you so much for your work. In New York City, ACS is responsible for protecting children from abuse and neglect by providing, among other things, child protective services, preventive services, foster care, and programs for at-risk youth. The 2007 OCFS study mentioned by Councilmember Filler in his opening found that a large proportion of sexually exploited children in New York City seek these services ACS has to offer. 
According to the report, at least 85% of sexually exploited children have been involved in the child welfare system. 75% have been placed in foster care and over half have been placed in juvenile justice system. Given these statistics, it is clear that ACS is in a prime position to identify sexually exploited children. Over the years, ACS has been working with various organizations to address the special needs of sexually exploited children. For example, the Gateways program operated by JCCA is an intensive specialized residential and treatment program for girls ages 12 to 16 who are victims of commercial sexual exploitation and domestic trafficking. JCCA also operates the Specialized Family Foster Care Program, which places sexually exploited children with foster parents who are specially trained to work with this population. Lastly, the New Beginnings Program at St. Luke's, an, an agency contracted by ACS, provides an intensive clinical therapy for sexually exploited children ages 12 to 17 and their families within their homes. These are incredible programs doing great work. However, without knowing the number of children being sexually exploited in New York City, it is impossible to design programs and services to adequately meet their needs. For example, the Gateway program only has a capacity of 14 beds. Without data from ACS and DYCD demonstrating the need to increase capacity, it makes it difficult to ensure there are adequate services available. In requiring the city to identify sexually exploited children, proposed Intro number 866-8 can ensure that this population has access to adequate services and no child slips through the cracks. Thank you so much um, for being here today again to help us um, find ways to um, address this issue and I now welcome the testimony from the administration. Thank you Chairwoman Palmer and you've been a terrific partner in all of this uh, going forward. Um, We've been joined by Councilmember Ku, and our first panel is Commissioner Richter, uh, Susan Morley from ACS, both from ACS, uh, and Deborah Harper and Andrew Miller from DYCD. It's all yours. Good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairs Palma and uh, Fiddler, and uh, Council Members Rodriguez and Ku. Good morning. I'm Ron Richter, the Commissioner of New York City's Administration for Children's Services, and as you said, with me today is Susan Morley, ACS's Senior Advisor for Investigations. Uh, thank you for this uh, opportunity to address the proposed legislation related to reporting data on sexually exploited young people. Before we address the legislation directly, I would like to share the work that Children's Services has done over the past several years since the passage of the Safe Harbor Act in 2008 to address the needs of sexually exploited youth. We have undertaken this work on a number of fronts through our child protective, preventive, foster care, and juvenile justice programs in order to identify youth who are being or have been sexually exploited, as well as to train staff and establish services that can address the unique needs of these youth. As the Council is aware, New York City was recently al allocated $622,000 in state funding to address the needs of this population. We have collaborated extensively with DYCD and have reached out to providers and advocates who are engaged in this work to gather their input. Earlier this month, we developed and submitted a plan outlining the city's proposed use of these funds to the New York State Office of Children and Family Services. We are very pleased to report that just last week the plan was approved by the state and we are happy to share the details of it this morning. ACS offers supportive services as well as placement options and programs designed to address the special needs of this population. Young people come into contact with children's services for many reasons, including but not limited to domestic violence, substance abuse, behavioral issues, and or mental health issues. The symptomology of these issues can make it particularly difficult for the best social workers to discover when a child or youth is being or has been sexually exploited. In addition, youth come into contact with ACS through a number of doors. We see children in the course of our child protective investigations at our children's center, which as many of you know is our facility that cares for children who are in our custody awaiting foster care placements, in our contracted foster care and preventive programs, and in our juvenile justice programs and facilities. 
In the past several years, ACS has established processes to help identify and address instances of sexual exploitation, whether they are identified during the course of a child protective investigation, when a child is arrested, is being served through our children's center, is in foster care, or is engaged with our preventive service providers. <clears throat> In recent years, ACS has invested in strengthening both our investigative capacity and our clinical expertise in order to better assess these issues. In 2006, Children's Services hired its first team of investigative consultants, retired law enforcement investigators led by Susan Morley, who is a former commanding officer of the NYPD Special Victims Division. We now have 108 investigative consultants with extensive law enforcement experience. Any case involving suspected sexual exploitation triggers an immediate alert to our investigative consultants. In addition, each of our borough child protective offices has a team of clinical social work staff who have expertise in issues of violence and trauma that we see in cases involving sexually exploited youth. ACS contracts with providers to offer both placement options for sexually exploited children as well as supportive service options designed to address the special needs of this population. We contract with preventive, foster care, and residential providers that work with this population. Since 2009, the Jewish Child Care Association, as you mentioned, JCCA, has operated a residential program called Gateways that provides intensive special care for girls aged 12 to 16 who have been victims of commercial sexual exploitation and trafficking. This program houses 12 youth and remains at or near full capacity at all times. ACS also contracts with JCCA for a specialized family foster care program that places sexually exploited youth with foster parents who are trained to offer a therapeutic home environment while the young person receives a full range of medical, emotional, and psychological services to address their unique needs. The foster care program is currently being developed and expected uh, to serve 24 youth when it's, once it is fully operational. In addition, JCCA runs a residential program to support sexually exploited young women who are in non-secure placement through the juvenile justice system. JCCA currently supports these youth using two models, sanctuary and gateways, and a four-phase model of treatment that includes assessment, individual and family therapy, and peer counseling. The JCCA non-secure placement residents can accommodate six young people. ACS also contracts with the New Beginnings program at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital Center. Their community services for children and families is a clinical program intended to maintain sexually exploited youth safely in their homes by providing intensive therapy to the youth and family members. In 2012, St. Luke's Sexually Exploited Preventive Services program served 38 families. Finally, Children's Services has a long-standing partnership with GEMS, a nationally recognized organization that works with sexually exploited youth through intervention and outreach, direct support services, training, and technical assistance. GEMS has been invaluable to us at the Children's Center. We must comprehensively assess children at the center, which is often our first point of contact with them. GEMS has worked closely with our staff to provide training on how to identify and assess risk factors for sexual exploitation. Another critical component of our work with this population involves training staff in several of our divisions to be able to identify and assist exploited youth. And when I say several of our divisions, I mean our Division of Child Protection, our Division of Youth and Family Justice, which is the juvenile justice part of our agency, the Division of Family uh, Permanency Services, Foster Care, um, the Division of family, uh, family Court Legal Services, so the lawyers in our family court, um, and Family Support Services, which includes our Office of Child and Family Health, Preventive Services, and Community Partnerships, and of course our investigative consultants. In May of 2012, ACS, in collaboration with Safe Horizons Anti-Trafficking Unit, the Manhattan and Brooklyn District Attorney's Offices, the NYPD Vice Enforcement Coordinator, 
end prostitution and child trafficking and St. Luke's New Beginnings program held an all-day training for staff in our Division of Child Protection to discuss human trafficking and discuss how to define, identify, understand, and engage youth who may have been, may have been or are being trafficked for sex. Our staff was provided with critical information to help them identify the red flags for youth who are being trafficked for sex. A total of 411 ACS staffers attended this training. This forum was also broadcast live to all Division of Child Protection borough office sites for viewing by staff. We think this type of opportunity is critical to our progress on educating children's services. Subsequently, ACS released a policy in June 2012 regarding assessment and safety planning for commercially sexually exploited children. The policy provided guidance to ACS staff on how to identify, engage, support, and develop safety plans for children who are victims of sex trafficking. The policy, as well as a desk aid guide produced for CPS, direct staff to identify, work with parents and caretakers when applicable, and find targeted services to help children recover from sex trafficking. Since the May training, ACS has conducted additional training with child protective offices in each borough in which a total of 275 additional frontline staffers have participated. As the Council is aware, the Safe Harbor legislation allows for the conversion of family court delinquency cases of youth under the age of 16 who are arrested for prostitution to a person in need of supervision petition. Conversion to a PINS petition prevents the young victim of sexual exploitation from being prosecuted for prostitution and allows that young person to receive critical support and services. In 2010, ACS, with the assistance from the mayor's office began to coordinate with other city agencies, including DYCD, the law department, probation, PD, to implement the act's provisions and to develop a protocol for ensuring that sexually exploited youth receive necessary services. That protocol included a role for each agency. The law department assists with the PINS conversion process. ACS places children in the appropriate level of care and secures services for them, and DYCD establishes drop-in centers to serve impacted youth. In addition to the work we're doing here at ACS, stakeholders citywide are collaborating to address the unique needs of sexually exploited youth. In 2006, Mayor Bloomberg established the Anti-Human Trafficking Task Force, chaired by Deputy Mayor Carol Robles Roman, to coordinate efforts to combat foreign and domestic human trafficking and the commercial sexual, sexual exploitation of children. The task force, of which I am a member, meets quarterly and brings together experts from state and federal law enforcement, city and state government agencies, service providers, advocacy groups, and other community-based organizations. In addition, ACS co-chaired a work group with the Council of Family and Child Caring Agencies, Kafka, to assist provider agencies in becoming more informed on this issue. This work led to a roundtable discussion with experts on sexual exploitation that included the FBI, the District Attorney's Office, and providers with expertise in this area. As I mentioned earlier, last fall, New York State's Office of Children and Family Services allocated $622,200 in funding to New York City to address the needs of sexually exploited children through the development and implementation of a statewide child welfare response to child sex trafficking. Through the extensive interagency collaboration with DYCD and an informal survey with a variety of stakeholders, providers, and advocates, ACS received valuable input on the need for expanded services. We also held a public hearing last week to allow for additional feedback. I would like to take a few minutes to walk you through our plan, which was approved last week by OCFS and which, will begin to implement, which we will begin to implement immediately. The plan includes eight primary components. First, DYCD has a street outreach team that seeks out youth in areas where they tend to congregate at night, including public spaces, subway stations, transportation hubs, and other areas. The workers provide information about services for vulnerable youth and transport them to a safe environment, be it their home, another safe environment, or a crisis shelter. With these additional funds, we will increase the program's capacity to identify and engage youth at risk of sexual exploitation who may be AWOL from foster care placements. In addition, we will create and implement training and tracking mechanisms around engaging sexually exploited youth and encourage them to return to their foster homes. 
To improve information sharing, street outreach teams will communicate regularly with our Children's Center and with Children's Services AWOL unit, which assists provider agencies with identifying and re-engaging youth who have run away from foster care placements. Current street outreach units serve approximately 480 youth per month. Children's Services projects this additional street outreach will serve approximately 4,300 more children at high risk of sexual exploitation. Second, we plan to place masters and social work counselors from agencies that contract with DYCD and have experience in providing services to sexually exploited youth at ACS's Children's Center to engage youth and prevent AWOLs. Provider agency staff will also train and consult with Children's Services staff to build our capacity to identify and engage these youth and appropriately direct them to the, exist, to the existing services I've discussed. Provider agency staff will work at the Children's Center during times of day and night when youth are at higher risk of leaving the facility, such as evenings and weekends, for up to 60 hours per week. We expect this combination of capacity building and direct services to improve service delivery to all high-risk youth ages 11 and older entering the Children's, service, children's Center, excuse me, which sees approximately 8,000 youth per year. Third, as the Youth Services Committee is already aware, DYCD runs a summer youth employment program which provides New York City youth between ages eight, uh, 14 and 24 with summer employment and educational experiences. We plan to use a portion of the state safe harbor funds to increase the capacity of this program. DYCD will set aside 40 summer youth employment slots to specifically serve foster care youth who are placed in a specialized sexually exploited foster care placement or at the Children's Center by providing them with opportunities so that they become, can become familiar with the world of work, gain employment experience, and identify educational pathways that support career and life goals. Fourth, it is critical that we identify youth at risk of exploitation as early as possible and connect them to the specialized preventive foster care and juvenile justice services that we offer. We will use a portion of the funds to build the capacity of ACS staff and service providers to identify and engage more of them by pro developing program champions within key areas of children's services. These program champions will be a resource and liaison for staff members on all issues related to sexual exploitation within child protection, foster care, and preventive program areas with an increased focus within the education, AWOL, and older youth services units. Children's Services will release a request for proposals to engage a provider experienced on the issue of child sexual exploitation who can work with designated staff to design a curriculum that will be shared with other city agencies serving similar populations. Fifth, we are using funds to specifically target our Division of Youth and Family Justice. We will hire an expert in this area to train case managers, placement and permanency specialists, and youth counselors to identify, understand, and refer youth to specialized services appropriately. The expert will coordinate their training of juvenile justice staff with the trauma-informed care initiative that DYFJ is currently implementing in partnership with Bellevue Hospital as part of the National Child Trauma Stress Initiative and the Prison Rape Elimination Act, PREA initiative ACS is launching to comply with the new regulations issued by the U.S. Department of Justice to help juvenile facilities prevent, detect, and respond to sexual misconduct. In addition to training, the expert will produce a resource guide that staff can use to refer young people when they are discharged from juvenile placements and detention. We will share the resource guide with other city agencies serving similar populations, including the Department of Probation. Sixth, we will use the funds to strengthen and provide additional expertise to the Jewish Child Care Association and St. Luke's specialized sexually exploited programs with the goal of further developing their treatment service models, creating strategies to recruit foster homes for sexually exploited youth, and for improving outreach efforts to ensure specialized programs are receiving appropriate referrals and are fully utilized. Seventh, we will use the funding 
to hire an expert to work with ACS to develop a comprehensive plan with strategies that advance our approaches to working with sexually exploited youth, particularly around addressing the complicated and destructive relationship between the young person and their trafficker. Part of this vision will include enhanced coordination among city agencies, courts, and citywide stakeholders. The plan will also include an analysis of needs, types of services available, gaps in services, prioritization of new service needs for future funding allocations, and will outline both short-term and long-term goals towards an improved response to child exploitation in New York City. Finally, advocates and stakeholders citywide, including the Council, have expressed the difficulties with and the need for an increase in the collection of data on sexually exploited young people. To begin to address this issue, ACS will use a portion of this OCFS funding to hire a consultant to evaluate current data collection methods of sexually exploited service providers in child welfare and juvenile justice and to identify both short-term and long-term opportunities to improve data collection analysis and reporting. ACS continues to work systematically on a number of fronts through our child protective, preventive, foster care, and juvenile justice programs to identify youth that may be or are being or have been sexually exploited and to train staff and establish services that can address this problem. Through these efforts, we have learned that identifying sexually exploited youth who come into care with children's services can be challenging for many, reason, ma many reasons. Many youth are understandably reticent to disclose sexual exploitation. Some feel ashamed. Some fear retribution by their abusers, while others are conflicted about the potential prosecution of their abusers. As I mentioned earlier, youth also enter ACS care for a variety of reasons, including substance abuse, mental health concerns, and or domestic violence on the part of their families. Any or all of these could mask issues relating to sexual exploitation. As the Council knows, identification of sexual exploitation is much more, much more challenging than simply marking a box on a form. As much as we want to know what the need is, our priority is to serve and protect youth who need help. Despite these challenges, we agree with the Council that collecting and tracking data regarding this population is important, which is why we are allocating funds to bolster our ability to track and share data among city agencies. We therefore support the proposed legislation requiring ACS and DYCD to submit an annual report documenting the number of youth who are referred to us as sexually exploited, who self-identify as sexually exploited, or who we determine to be ex sexually exploited at some point in our time serving them. We hope that with the additional state resources, New York City will have the ability to understand the extent of the need and be able to appropriately support and assist sexually exploited youth, um, to assist sexually exploited youth, this, um, the, this population. Um, thank you um, for this opportunity. Um, Ms. Morley and I are um, eager to answer your questions. Good morning. Good morning, Chairs Fiddler and Palmer and members of the Committees on Youth Services and General Welfare. I am Deborah Harper, Assistant Commissioner for Runaway and Homeless Youth at the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development. I'm also seated with Andrew Miller, Assistant Commissioner for External Relations at DYCD. On behalf of Commissioner Jean, B, Jeannie B. Mulgraff, thank you for the opportunity to testify on introduction of number 866A, which requires reporting data related to sexually exploited children. We appreciate the Council's continued support for our city's most vulnerable young people. I will keep my overview of RHY services brief as the committee is well informed of the RHY continuum. Our coordinated model includes street outreach and transportation services, a drop-in center in each borough, emergency shelters, and transitional independent living till facilities. Each DYCD funded RHY facility employs a social worker who is responsible for helping youth to receive appropriate services. Young people are assessed and evaluated for their mental health needs. The comprehensive assessment evaluates the psychiatric history of each young, of each young person, including screening for suicidal ideation, 
sexual exploitation, depression, and thoughts of sadness, history of violence or mental illness, and school functioning. For the purposes of today's hearing, we will share with you some information about the number of young people who identified themselves as either sexually abused or exploited in fiscal year 2012. A total of seven, 71 young people identified themselves as abused or exploited. The vast majority, or 58, disclosed this information while in a TIL program. We believe this is because young people feel more comfortable identifying themselves as being sexually abused or exploited the longer they have been in our care. We support the overall goal of intro 866A, which is to provide greater focus on the needs of sexually exploited youth served by both DYCD and ACS through our residential services. We ask that the Council consider limiting the bill to these systems. As currently drafted, the bill would require all DYCD programs, not just runaway and homeless youth programs, to be included in the report. All of our providers are mandated by law to report cases of abuse and neglect and take appropriate action. However, uh, we request that the bill focus attention where it's most needed within the RHY system. We we were pleased that the city was awarded $622,000 from the state to further enhance services to sexually exploited young people through the Safe Harbor grant program. This will provide some welcome relief considering that the state funding to RHY services has decreased 60% over the past several years from approximately $2 million to $744,000. We are grateful for the support of ACS and are pleased to be joined by Commissioner Ron Richter. The plan he outlined helps further integrate our, service, our agency services for sexually exploited youth. Specifically for DYCD, it focuses on three areas. Additional street outreach, sexually exploited service providers at the ACS Children's Center, and summer youth employment slots. It is important to note that the future of Safe Harbor funding is uncertain. It was added to the state budget for the first time in the current state fiscal year, but it was not included in the governor's proposed budget for next year. Commissioner Mulgrave has traveled to Albany twice over the past few weeks and met with legislators to discuss state funding for youth programs. We are hopeful that this funding will be included in the state's, state legislature, legislature's conference committee um, <clears throat> recommendations expected in mid-March. We again thank ACS for their partnership and we look forward to continuing our efforts to better serve the needs of sexually exploited youth. We will be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you and uh, we've been joined by Councilmember Van Bramer. Uh, we were also joined previously by Councilmembers Wills and Gonzalez. Um, <clears throat> Commissioner Richter, uh, if you would started uh, your testimony with your support for 866A. I could have said you had me at a low. Uh, but uh, I appreciate uh, your support uh, for the legislation. And uh, Ms. Harper, um, I, I understand the, um, uh, the problems DYC with DYCD might have, uh, you know, given the breadth of, of uh, diversity of the programs that, that fall under your aegis, uh, if we required uh, to do every program. So we will take a look at that issue if there is anything uh, other than um, street outreach, crisis shelters and tills where you think you do run programs that might, you know, lend itself to the reporting uh, requirement. I, mean, I, can't, I can't imagine, you know, trying to report uh, anything other than cases of abuse that become uh, you become aware of, of the, uh, the 40,000 people who pass through the Summer Youth Employment Program. Uh, stuff like that. I, I don't think that's what we intended, although in, in the ideal world that would be, be great. Um, uh, Commissioner uh, Richter, um, uh, you know, actually both of you in listening uh, to your testimony about what we're going to do with $622,000 of state funding, I recognize that that is a pittance. Uh, and if it weren't for the fact that it's the first time that it's been included in the budget, I would call it shameful. Uh, but it was better than what uh, was happening uh, before. When taken in context of uh, uh, what Ms. Harper uh, pointed out about the uh, reduction in state funding for the RHY continuum from $2 million to $744,000, uh, you know, you realize that they haven't even 
caught up uh, to where they were uh, just a few, year, few years ago. I, I, I remember the, the uh, governor uh, telling everyone that he had preserved the safety net, and uh, I seriously question that when it comes to uh, children sleeping on the street, um, uh, and there are clearly more of them. Uh, I did, you know, notice in your testimonies that uh, a great deal of this $622,000 is for uh, training um, and not so much for services. And so the concern I would have first, and I would ask you to, to comment on, is we're going to do all this training. Ostensibly, we're going to identify a greater percentage of the sexually exploited youth who are coming through our doors as being sexually exploited where are we going to put them if we're not increasing services? I mean, even the, uh, the services increase at DYCD for street outreach uh, is terrific. I mean, I can't, you know, everyone who knows me knows that I'm, I'm for that at 10,000%. But where are we going to put them all uh, if, if we find them? I mean, are we just going to find them, tag them, and throw them back? Um, so that is... Uh, uh, Fair uh, question, Chair uh, Fiddler, and um, we uh, thought a lot about that question ourselves as we were trying to figure out what to do with $622,000 of one-time funding. And um, part of our challenge um, with this population um, that we acknowledge is, um, is actually identifying the population and trying to figure out um, how to do that better. And so we did think that it was important for us um, with this funding opportunity to um, leverage the opportunity to I inform our staff um, using the best resources that we have in the city um, about how to work better with what we consider to be a revolving door with sexually exploited youth um, to um, interview young people more effectively, um, to talk to young people in a way that um, allows us to impart information and also allows us to listen um, more actively and to um, get expertise um, and to train trainers um, so that in the first instance we actually can get a sense of what our numbers really look like um, and can begin to um, learn more about the variation in our sexually exploited youth population at ACS. And so, so I think that actually we um, get a handle on what we're looking at. I think then we can start to understand what services we actually need and maybe what services we should be, you know, purchasing ourselves um, aside from the $622,000. But what constrained us in terms of purchasing beds, for example, is that this is one-time funding and we didn't think it was responsible to use it if it's not going to be here next year and the year after. I mean, that, that was part of what, what went into our thinking. You know, that's a, a great point, and it's a terrific segue for something that I've been meaning to bring up, and I, I, I'm glad you did. Every year, we, we fund $12 million worth of uh, shelter beds for runaway and homeless youth. Seven million of it is one-time funding every year. Every one of those providers has to go out there and secure a location, commit to a lease, uh, you know, commit to run a program, uh, and every single year that money is excluded from the mayor's executive budget and it becomes a matter of uh, the council uh, standing up and, and, and fighting for it. So uh, I would then assume that everyone sitting at this table will support the baselining of the RHY funding in this year's budget. Uh, it's something I've given a lot of thought to. We've made a lot of progress, not nearly enough. We've made a lot of progress in the 11 some odd years that I have chaired this committee. Uh, I'm not going to be here next year. Uh, I full well would like to see that money baseline before I'm gone uh, because I don't want to, to leave the burden on my colleagues who will remain behind to have to fight for the same turf over and over and over again. Maybe we can actually make some progress. But uh, having said what you just said, I think it's completely consistent and I would hope that uh, both agencies would advocate with OMB for baseline and the RHY funding at least. Um, having said that, and by the way, we've been joined by uh, Council Members Arroyo, Cabrera, and King. 
Uh, we're all on the same train. Um, you know where the train is going now. Um, uh, the uh, I would have to. Well, first of all, let me ask: Is the the uh, the safe harbor funding is in the governor's budget proposal? Though, am I correct about that? The continuation of it? Um, I I I I'm, I I'm not sure. I, I can't answer that question. I, I, Guys, I, I, anybody? I, think, uh, I thought I heard that the answer to that is no. It's not. Um, I'm going to be in Albany this week. I think that uh, Commissioner Mulgrav was already in Albany trying to make progress on that. We obviously feel that it is critical that it be um, funded. And I will use the word shameful because, you know, the fact that uh, they, they passed this legislation years ago, didn't fund it, and then they finally throw a couple of nickels into it and they're going to take them back out. Uh, they, they, you know, if, if that is the final result, then they should all be ashamed of themselves. And, and quite frankly, I'm, I'm willing to say here the governor should be ashamed of himself for not putting it to the budget. Um, it, it, that is a outrageous. Uh, you know, and I was just going to, you know, assume for a second that it was, and that uh, the next, uh, uh, you know, the next question would be, okay, now we've trained the trainers. Um, what's the next step if we be so bold as to imagine that they will uh, throw us the same nickels and dimes that they've been throwing? Um, we'll have bought a van. We'll have trained the trainers. Uh, you're hiring two different people, if I get your testimony, uh, if I glean that. We're hiring some staff for the additional outreach van. Um, what, what, what's next? So, uh, I mean, my hope is that we will have learned something from the work that we will have done in terms of what our actual needs are uh, and that we will work together with the council, with other city agencies to make some much better informed decisions about what services we need. Um, I'm, you know, I'm hopeful uh, that we will be able to provide um, additional services to young people in the way that uh, St. Luke's Roosevelt has been serving children and that we will also be able to provide uh, additional services to young people in foster care. I would, I, you know, I think that our, our you know, last choice should always be a, a congregate setting outside of the city. but. I would, I would like us to try to figure out um, what our needs actually are before we, um, before we answer that question. Um, and I don't think we have enough I'd say information. I thought the trend right was to uh, slow the number of, uh, or reduce the number of congregate settings outside the city for uh, juveniles. So right. uh, I would, would think that wouldn't be something that we're thinking about. And the, um, um, uh, you know, I'm going to just ask uh, one other question, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Chairwoman Palmer. I have, you know, a number of other, uh, a few other questions as well. Uh, uh, Ms. Harper, do we have any results on the uh, RHY homeless count? Uh, no, uh, Chairman. We'll, um, we're anticipating DHS having their numbers um, together because, you know, they were part of it as well at the, um, at the end of March before the report goes into the federal government in April. And, and do I recall correctly that the questionnaire for the uh, homeless youth includes questions about sexual exploitation or sex trafficking? Um, the questionnaire that we were doing in our sites did, yes. Okay. Chairwoman Palmer? Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner Richter, can you just take me through the process of how ACS staff um, identifies um, sexually exploited children? So, as I said in my testimony, um, the process of identifying sexually exploited young people um, is always part of um, you know, what we think is good social work. And so um, the young person coming in any of our doors, whether it's through a child protective investigation or through a juvenile justice door um, or is in foster care with one of our agencies, um, we are um, consistently um, you know, hopeful that our social workers have enough training in sexually exploited youth that they've, that they've, um, that they're thinking in terms of relationship building with young people about this issue. There are particular kinds of cases 
where we think that these issues um, need to be particularly um, focused on. And so um, there are protocols that are followed in certain kinds of cases that should get at this information much more deliberately. I'm going to turn it over to um, Sue Morley, who I think can probably answer your question more directly. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, as was in the testimony, we did a training conference um, which Safe Horizons helped us a great deal on, as well as the follow-up training in the boroughs. And after that training conference, we developed a policy as well as a desk aid that addresses the red flags for human trafficking, um, how to engage the child, how to engage the parent, um, and um, it's, it's, the desk aid is very nice actually for the workers to put right on their desk. Um, and we also in the policy have um, direct them when you suspect it to also go to the retired detectives. And um, that policy really has, um, we have seen several cases where um, perhaps before the training we might not have seen cases that come in as educational neglect. And the mom thinks the daughter's doing drugs and she's running away and she's chronically running away. And um, through the training and through the investigative experience of the ICs, um, you know, we take certain investigative steps and look in certain databases. And um, a common thing that has been coming up is Backpage. Um, we have 12-year-old and 4-year-old girls that are coming in sometimes as educational neglect. And then when we do a workup, we discover them advertised on Backpage. Um, and then we do um, a lot of coordination with NYPD on those type of cases. And frequently, this is a girl that is, is running away and we're looking for her. And we use our resources as well as uh, the NYPD's uh, vice enforcement coordinator. We have a good relationship with them to find these children and bring, bring them back. Um, it is a challenge at times because um, we frequently find them and they frequently run away. And that's why I think it's so important that the commissioner is using the safe harbor funding to um, give us resources at our children's center um, and that we're going to bring in um, uh, the DYCD uh, experts that deal with uh, the contracts they have that deal with the uh, sexual exploitation um, into our children's center to not only model how to deal with these children uh, with our staff because this funding is limited hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get it back uh, but also um, to help screen and identify um, and help try to engage the kids from running away or taking others uh, with them. Is, how, how effective is the first visit in terms of identifying them and is after the, the in, that discovery is made is when the child runs away? Excuse it, me, it's, that it's, noise I couldn't hear, sorry. sorry. <laughs> it's in, in the initial contact with the youth. Right. Um, in that first initial contact, is there, uh, do we know that they're being sexually exploited? Not necessarily. Um, sometimes what, what we try to train the workers in is a different risk factors. Kids with prior sex abuse, kids with prior foster care, uh, children that are running away, children that are not going to school, children that have the older boyfriend. Um, but even the older boyfriend, and some, some of the young pimps are 20 years old. The, the age gap may not even be that, that different. Um, are the kids coming home? periodically and have things that, where'd you get the iPhone from, where'd you get the clothes from, um, while they disappearing. Um, so we're trying to train them to get more nosy when they get in these educational neglect cases, when they get in um, the parent that says my teenage daughter, that we may be in there for another reason and the, she says I really have trouble with my teenage daughter, she's running around, she has an older boyfriend. So really look for those risk factors and then really uh, when they interview the, the child to assess for that and we give them certain questions to ask. So, so um, the 14-year-old um, or 13-year-old who has the 18-year-old boyfriend um, has, you know, is, an, is a perfect example of a case where we expect our child protective specialists and we expect our case planners at for foster care agencies to use the desk aid that I just had handed to you, which um, should lead to an entirely different uh, profile of questions. But I, I want to say... Um, Can I help? So the, the, 108, the 108 investigative consultants, um, 
they, when a child is identified, are, are they the, the first ones in contact with the child or is one of the other protective? No, our child protective specialist and, is responsible and for then making a referral to, to the investigative consultant and they're located in our borough offices. So th that referral is generated by this, the investigating case worker. Okay. But I want to say that, that, that because it, I think you know our agency in the first instances is in the first instances out there investigating the safety of a child, and so whatever allegations come over from the state central registry is the focus of that initial investigation, and then we expect our investigator, child protective investigator, to uh, you know look at the whole situation and because of what's in this desk aid and what we're learning we expect that to lead to questions that will determine whether a child is sexually exploited but it's not information that a child is very often going to just disclose and their parent oftentimes doesn't have any idea what's going on so is the fund the safe harbor funding going to be used to train both um, the 108 case um, investigative, investigative consultant and, and protective staff as well? Yes, I mean we're, we're trying to use it to, to train all of our staff and to train trainers. How many sexually exploited youth are currently now receiving um, services through ACS? Yeah. We had 38 families. So, so St. Luke's Roosevelt served um, I, I think in my testimony I said 38 families. Is that the capacity of it or is that? So 38 families and then JCCA's Gateways program serves uh, I think 12 young people at a time and it's pretty much always. What's the length of stay for, for those 12 individuals and, and their, their beds for females only? That is, that is correct. And, and we know that researchers have um, estimated that the higher population of being sexually exploited are males. So are there any programs um, in place to address the male population or would any of this funding create any of the so we So outside of this funding, we are currently in the process of developing and have allocated funds for JCCA to develop a foster care program for this population that I think will accommodate how many? 24 young people including males, boys, um, and we are in the process of bringing those homes online. So there will be availability and, and the date upon which they'll be ready I don't have. We expect them to be ready within three to six months. And, and this is going to be funds allocated directly to JCCA? Or it, yes, they're, we're, gonna, we're contracting with JCCA for those and that, that is, has nothing to do with this $622,000. Okay. That's sep out of ACS's budget separate and apart from this. And, and I will ask the same questions in regards to the LGBT youth. Are there any dedicated services specifically for the LGBT youth that are being sexually exploited as well? Um, so the expectation is that these programs would accommodate Absolutely. any youth, um, whether they're LGBTQ identifying or not. Um, so I also want to say that that my hope is clearly for the boys, which is a which is an issue that is you've identified that. Uh, Chair Fiddler identified that's a real issue that our therapeutic foster boarding homes you know can work with St. Luke's and other programs to um, take care of our boys in a you know in a foster home setting um, appropriately um, because we shouldn't have to wait three to six months for gateways to get these right. foster homes up and running and and so that would be what I would hope our plan would be at this point um, when we encounter a sexually exploited boy which clearly we have in New York there's no question about that I mean I think that what's critical about this opportunity for us though is that most 
sexually exploited young people that I think we encounter in the child welfare area. In detention, they're detained, so we have a much better opportunity to work with them because they're captive, obviously. Right. It's a captive audience. In child welfare, I think that a lot of these young people are using the children's center as a place to get a hot meal and a shower, and then they walk right out the door. And because of the law, we don't really have much opportunity other than our social work ability to sit with these young people and talk to them and I don't think that we have taken advantage of that. For example, we have medical services at the Children's Center and I don't think that our nursing staff has been adequately trained to take the opportunity of those young people accessing medical services there to really connect with those young people and talk to them. And so we have to really up the ante in terms of what we're how we're working with them at the Children's Center to, um, to really provide a lot of information about why we're not a negative system, but there might be opportunities for them with us. And so if this um, legislation is passed, how, how does DYCD plan to implement it? How, 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 what's going to be the methods used to, to do the tracking and, and to make sure that um, there's collaboration with DYCD? How will we work together? Um, well, I mean, we, we, part of what we're doing um, already is uh, setting up a working group that will have membership from both ACS and DYCD and other agencies in order to ensure that the plan that we've submitted and was approved by OCFS is actually effective. Um, so we want to try to see if these approaches to identifying and training um, work. Uh, and so as you know chair fiddler said like you know in year 2 will we know a lot more than we knew in year 1 and then what will we do with the information we have in terms of i in, in terms of working collaboratively with dycd i think that you know the development of this plan is a reflection of our collaboration around these young people we made sure that we shared information and that we um, that we are going to do that on an ongoing basis with respect to these young people um, and we've been in pretty much constant communication is that I'm if I understand your question is th that, that's exactly yeah what we, we intend to continue to do so I mean I think that you know the summer youth employment uh, opportunity for this population is one you know concrete example of how we think that you know our agency for example in detention this past summer had you know young people in detention who had summer youth employment opportunities we think that this was you know another example of connecting in that way for our agencies and and I know that you know that this um this council under the leadership of Councilmember Lou every year um, we're, we're asking DYCD and, and those um, and the administration to make sure not to reduce the funding for the, um, on the summer youth programs. Are, when you talk about these 47 slots that are going to be carved out for this population, are, are we talking about the slots that are now always in danger, you know, that, that continue to be in danger on a yearly basis to be um, reduced? So, Andrew Miller from DYCD, thank you for the question. Um, as you know, the, the mayor is committed to um, SYEP. In fact, we're pleased that uh, he has continued to add uh, $20.5 million into the budget. And we also just um, received good news that the state included uh, about $25 million statewide um, into SYEP, of which we anticipated getting, getting about, um, uh, about $13.5 million. So, in total, Right now, we estimate serving about 29,000 young people. Um, we had recently had a uh, request for proposals for new competition, and one of the competitions happened to be with vulnerable young people, and that would include 1,000 slots. And this would actually enable us to hire 40 additional uh, young people uh, through uh, the referral through ACS. So there will be newly created slots? Newly created slots, yes. Thank you. And I just have one more question. Um, in your testimony, Commissioner, the 480 youth per month that you referenced, um, then the next um, sentence said, through the training, um, the street outreach will serve approximately 4,300 more children. Um, is, would that be per month or? I think that's for, I think that's year. Yearly, okay. Yeah, I think that's, I that's annually. Okay, 
So it, um, the expectation is to be able to serve 4,300 annually. With the street outreach, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. I don't have any further questions at this time. Okay. Uh, we have a number of uh, council members who have questions. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Council Member Arroyo, followed by Council Member King. Okay. We were just trying to sort that out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, Commissioner, your staff. Um, the you referenced the drop in the centers, the drop in centers, I'm assuming is what you're referring to uh, for runaway youth, homeless runaway youth who come into these centers for a shower and then they leave. They don't want to hang around. I was referring to our children's center. Children's center. On 28th Street and 1st Avenue, the children's center where, um, you know, many young people we, we use the, the center for our placements into foster care. But okay. So I then um, thank you for the correction, but I want to talk about those providers that we fund to provide a safe place for young people who are homeless uh, to engage either a shower or... And so what, it, what is the expectation, contractual or otherwise, you have of providers that provide services for runaway youth and identifying those who might fit the sexually exploited category. Uh, okay, I, um, I guess you're referring to the RHY um, drop in centers. I don't know what you call right. them. Oh, um, there are mm -hmm. centers that you fund, there are providers that you fund across the city. Yes whose responsibility is to provide services for individuals who are out of a permanent home situation. Right, those would be the DYCD funded uh, drop-in centers, which are located in um, is at least one in every borough. So DYCD is not here with you? I'm DYCD. Okay, so what's your expectation of providers who you've contracted to provide services to this particular population with regards to helping to identify, because I think the, commi the ACS commissioner's statement that they're hard to identify, what's your expectation of those providers who are dealing with a population that we can guess there might be a high propensity for sexual exploitation? Well, our expectation is that the youth will be um, properly assessed at the drop-in centers. Each one of the DYCD um, sites is staffed with at least one um, full-time MSW um, staff person. And so if a young person is coming into a drop-in center on a repeated basis for the same type of um, services, you know, like coming in to get a shower, and there's other things, you know, they can look at the... Um, person's physical appearance and um, make assessments on that. Um, so what's expected is that um, they do take the steps to identify that, um, whether or not a young person is being sexually exploited, and then to um, take the steps to engage them in some counseling, and then eventually get them to move into our um, residential continuum. Um, so that's the expectation, that they will be so alerted to those um, identifiers so that they can get the proper So services. how many have been identified under that expectation? Um, in fiscal year 12, we had um, 56 young people who were um, identified as being sexually exploited. And at what point does ACS become involved, uh, DYCD contracting for the runaway youth or homeless youth, ACS being a different arm of the city administration, I'd like to believe you guys talk to each other, but my experience is that sometimes that doesn't happen. So where's the collaboration between the two agencies mm -hmm. to make sure that we get this individual or this $622,000 to touch that life? Okay, well, there is interaction between the two agencies. Um, we don't see a, a overwhelming number of young people under the age of 18, so it's not 
You uh, do not? We, no, we do not. Um, most of our young people are 18 and over. Um, so when there so are... Where does a 15-year-old who's homeless go? A 15-year-old, if they show up at um, any of our provider agencies, the provider agency is responsible to um, contact the um, parent or legal guardian, if available, if appropriate, depending on what the young person is telling us, and ACS. And so that would be when an ACS um, contact would definitely be made if a young person under the age of 16 was to appear. But um, any young person under the age of 18 um, would also go through that same protocol. Do we know how many we lose because of this policy? That we lose? Mm -hmm. um, when ACS is contacted, you know, um, our experience so far is that, you know, they do respond and, um, you know. So maybe one of the indicators in this data report should be the number of children under 18 that show up to the drop-in centers or I'm not sure what you call them, but, and then what happens to them? And what happens when ACS comes in and takes over the work um, to help get this individual to a permanent situation? Many are running away because their home situation is not safe or extremely conflicting mm -hmm. between parent and young person because of whatever the circumstances are. We also know that a majority of those are LGBT youth. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that this data, and, and once this is adopted and we, we include indicators that help us understand DYCD is not the one that's going to follow up on this individual's um, permanency, but then how many of them were referred to ACS, ACS became involved, and what the outcome of that individual's living situation, placement, et cetera, is, is something that we should be looking for as well. I'm going to talk about those in detention, and I'm, Commissioner Richter, I had a, a conversation with your staff, and I don't remember her name. She was very helpful, and I believe it was on Friday, and she might be in the room. What's your name? Jill? Thank you, Jill. <laughs> um, a case in my district of a young man who's being released from detention who does not want to go back home because he's afraid for his life. Uh, and as we engage in this process of reintegrating young people back into the community, what kind of alternatives we're offering or are available. Um, and I want to engage in a conversation. Um, the young man was released Friday and by Sunday he had been attacked and hurt really, really bad, almost killed, because he knew that the minute he went back on the block that something was going to happen. And I'm really concerned about those, in particular the first-time first offenders, who are looking for an, an alternative because they know that if they get back into the environment they came from, or the circumstances they came from, they will more than likely end up back in the system and, and that is something that um, I think we need to spend a little bit of time talking about and see how we can carve out services for individuals who are self-identifying. I, I really cannot go back because I know what waits for me is something that's going to be um, detrimental to me um, and will probably keep them in that repeat offender um, list. So I look forward to that conversation with you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councilmember King. Sorry, we've been joined by Council Members Mark Viverito, uh, Levin, and Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, OACS and DYCD, being here for today's conversation. I appreciate it. Um, as a ex-CPS worker, um, I understand the challenges that ACS goes through when it comes to dealing with certain populations and certain families. Um, but I do have a couple of questions 
that I want to get some clarity in which might be added to the data that we want to, that we want to incur. Um, when we talk about young people engaging in sexual behavior, it just doesn't start when they turn 17, 18, 15, or 14. So I would like to know um, what would you say right now is the time of first sexual contact or any type of sexual contact to the time you, they come into service to ACS? There, is there any type of data that can, um, that's been put together? If not, maybe we might want to start tracking, say, a, a seven-year-old who might have encountered something, but it doesn't play out until they're 13 or 14. They put them on the road to being sexually exploited by the time they become later on in, uh, in life. Um, start having those conversations and what kind of assessments are being done when a family does encounter ACS to find out if a seven-year-old, even though we're dealing with the 14-year-old in the house, are we touching base with the seven-year-old or the eight-year-old to find out what else is going on because, like I said, a child doesn't just all of a sudden, 14-year-olds don't know how to read. Something happened when they was in third grade that they didn't know how to start it. And it's the same thing with this type of behavior also. Um, my next question would be, are there, and I think I might have heard something similar that Councilmember Palmer touched on, are there any sweeps being done where we know where this activity is occurring throughout the city um, to stop that activity? Because if there aren't any um, demand, the supply we can kind of eliminate. Um, uh, is that being happening right now, sweeps of those areas that they're high prostitution areas. Um, I know I saw something about working with the district attorney and NYPD, but how is that really having an impact? Um, also, for those young people who don't want help, it's hard to help somebody who doesn't want to be helped. How do we get through to them to let them know that, you know, you're not going to be that 17-year-old being exploited. You don't have to live this way. You know, what is life going to look for you at 25? How is DYCD, those agencies um, servicing these young people to help them pull, them pull themselves out of that? Um, so I'm going to stop right there and just to hear what you have to say on that. Thank you. Uh, so um, with, with respect to, and I, I guess I'll start by saying it's always um, helpful to uh, have someone who's been a child protective specialist because uh, I haven't done the job, but I know that um, I've been working with child protective specialists my whole career, and unless you have done the job, um, you can't possibly know how hard it is. And, uh, and so adding this, you know, I handed uh, Chair Palma the desk aid, you know, how, you know how many desk aids RCPS have and how much is in their head when they're trying to do this job of assessing safety. And it's a very hard job. It so, is. Um, so to answer your question, um, the profile of the sexually exploited child, if you will, um, you know, Sue Morley knows a lot more about it than I do, but um, generally speaking, the, more often than not, and this is a generalization, um, the young person has been sexually abused at some point in their life, probably when they were younger, and the prostitution, I think you said, the studies show started um, in between 12 and 14 years old. The trafficking, if you will, started between 12 and 14. I think this is for young people who we know in the United States, young people who have been sexually exploited. So there are um, signs that we can look for. So if a child um, was sexually abused when they were younger, there's a greater likelihood that they might be sexually exploited and something that we should be thinking about that is part of our training in terms of identifying sexually exploited young people um, and so it gives us something to go on and um, and I do think that the more that we know about what we can provide to our staff the better we'll do at identifying who these young people are um, so in terms of street outreach, um, we, we do know that there are particular parts of the city where young people tend to congregate at night, hot spots for, um, for sexually exploited youth. And we are working with uh, street works in particular, which um, is a part of Safe Horizons, um, to um, target those parts of the city uh, in order to, um, you know, do the best job we can at, at uh, providing services uh, to 
um, young people who are who are being sexually exploited. Um, so there is there is some knowledge here in the city about where these kids are. Um, and um, I don't know, Sue, do you want to add to either of those answers? Actually, one of the conversations I have with the vice coordinator is um, to, to ask him for a training for the investigative consultants to start with um, on what they're seeing and um, what are the areas, just to keep us updated. I mean, we know the typical areas that a lot of the kids come through the Port Authority and they get victimized there. Um, but we're also fighting technology now. Um, the kids have iPhones. It's not always on the street like years ago. There is still some on the street. But with, with technology, that's, that's the other thing that we have to keep up on. And, um, and it also sometimes helps us find the kids, too, though. So, so let me just follow up. Um, you had a third question. That yes. I think okay, for please. The right. In terms of um, identifying the young people and helping them to understand that you know this isn't a lifestyle that you want to keep and one day you will be 25 and this isn't what you want to be doing we provide as much information at every entry point within our continuum as we can so the um, the street outreach workers they have literature with um, with them about sexual exploitation and um, you know and the gamut of youth services within New York City. And also they're um, given information of where our drop-in centers are. If they do not want to be transported um, when the street outreach team encounters them, um, they are given information and directions on how to get to one of our drop-in centers so that, you know, if they want to do that, you know, at another time in the morning, you know, they are given that information. So um, that's, you know, there's, there's but so much that you can do when the youth is not willing to come in and receive services, but we do try to inundate them with information so that when they do have that moment, you know, that they, you know, wake up and say, hey, this is it for me, they know exactly where they can go for services. Okay. Um, thank you. Just two more. Um, just one of five, you mentioned that you do know where the hot spots are, the number of hot spots are. So what is the plan to kind of shut down those hot spots? Well, well DYC, DYCD's role is really to get the young person out of that hot spot into a safe place. I think that maybe what you're asking is, is in terms of law enforcement. Yeah, I'm just trying to just trying to hear because if we know there's a drug spot here, we try to shut it down. So now we know this is a spot with prostitution. What's the plan to try to shut it down and, you know, pull those kids out of there into safety? Well, so, you know, I use the expression hot spot. It's, it's more, it's a place where kids hang out. So it's not like they're out breaking the law where they're hanging out. They're, it's where kids congregate. So um, they're not doing anything bad while they're hanging out other than being, you know, kids. Um, so it's, it's an issue of the, the, the opportunity to go out and talk to kids and educate kids where they are and where they're at. And mm -hmm. so we have to take advantage of that opportunity um, more than we have been doing because a lot of those young people, we think, are actually in foster care. And, right. um, and so they go from where they're hanging out and get involved in bad stuff, whether it's through activity they're involved in on the internet or through pimps that they know, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. And so we know where they're hanging out um, mm -hmm. and we need to do a better job of providing them with information on, you know, on a wavelength that they can connect with. Uh, and we haven't, I don't think, been doing that as effectively as we could be. Okay, so at least we to my next question, just, if you just bear with me. Um, and, I, and I do want to answer your other question as well, which is, I think, the, what makes this the most challenging um, issue maybe we have, which is that, you know, the Gateways program, which is a fantastic program that JCCA runs for this population, works when a young person is ready to sort of give up the life. They've sort of had this epiphany and they say, I'm ready to work towards changing my life. Many of these young people are not there. Right. They're very happy with this life. They're getting money. They're experiencing, you know, going out to restaurants and living a, living a life that they've never had before. And the best comparison I can make from when I was 
you know, a teenager, is people who I knew who got involved in a cult. And they were, they were sort of living this life where they had to be deprogrammed. Right. And our kids really do need to mm -hmm. be deprogrammed when they get involved in this because it's a total separate thing from what their home life is, is about. And they've made a very de deliberate choice to be a part of it. And getting them out of it is really about, you know, deprogramming. Yeah. Um, so I don't want to beat the foster care system over the head. I don't want to do that because I know it's challenging enough. But what do you do when, when you have programs that you find that are ineffective? And, and I'm not just talking about the kids that need to be deprogrammed, but if you have programs that you find that are ineffective, or even if you have workers who, no matter how amount of training they've gone through, they just can't seem to deliver young people, you know, to sanity again. Um, what, what do we do with, with that, with, with that team that you have in place? How, does, how, how do you deal with that? So we have, uh, at ACS, we have uh, monitors that monitor our programs, and we have um, a scorecard, is what we call it, that scores our agencies, and we have a whole um, range of uh, ways that we go about ensuring that our programs are delivering the outcomes that we expect. Um, we currently have programs that are on heightened monitoring, that are on different levels of probation, and we take their contracts away if they don't perform the way that they're supposed to perform. I mean, we obviously give programs an opportunity to improve. We have an agency program assistance department that goes out and helps programs try to um, improve. Um, we shut down intake for programs that are not performing properly, um, but um, but we ultimately take away contracts. Is that your question? Well, that's, thank you, because that's good to know, because I've been in the foster care system of working it, and I've seen how some of them just aren't doing what these children need to get done, yeah. but still they get the contract, they still get the funding, and at the end of the day, our kids are the ones that, that, you know, that still struggle. So thank you. Thank you for answering my questions, and I appreciate it. Um, thank you, thank Council you. Member, and uh, we've been joined by Council Members uh, Lander and Brewer, uh, and, and Council Member King actually touched on a couple of the areas that I was going to uh, follow up on. So let's just go with that last one. Um, you know, what, what happens when you identify a sexually exploited young person and the problem is at their foster care placement? It's either another uh, young person there or, God, even worse, a supervisor. What do you do then? Okay, so um, the, the if, if, it, if it's a, first of all, the, the, if a crime is occurring, the police are called. So I, and, I've, and I have found myself saying that to a foster care provider. You know, if, if there's criminal activity afoot, then the police are contacted because that's what should happen. Do you have um, any statistics on how often that happens in your system? Uh, do I? Um, I, I don't have it at the ready, but it, we, uh, but but you, but you compile those. Do we compile right. data? Do you know on how often one of your providers calls the police because there's criminal activity I do, going I, on? I, do, I don't think I do. I, I don't think I do. I, I, I fortunately I don't think it's it's something that it that's Commissioner, a, that's, wouldn't you think that's something you'd want to know? I mean, each time that happens, I yes, would think and, you'd and, I, know. and I'm sure I mean, if there's I, one one provider that has a repeated absolutely. You know, history. And I'm sure I do know because they're required to tell me. But whether you, your question was, do I compile it? And I don't believe I compile it, but I am required to know as the commissioner when something like that happens. So the answer is, of course, I know about it. Um, the so would you be would you object if this bill um, required you as well to uh, uh, to compile uh, criminal complaints uh, of a sexual nature? Uh, a sexual exploitation nature uh, at your at your uh, facilities. You mean with our with our providers, or because I mean I I I think that some data is actually collected with respect to our secure facilities and is published. I I if I'm well, if with I'm respect correct. to providers, your secure facilities, so all you know, all the all the programs. You know that are housing young people. I mean, yeah, I mean, I would. You, you, you I have would have a problem with that. That'd be, we'd I would be that. happy to review any language that you want to share with me, and, and obviously, I think this is a very important issue for sure. Well, I'm not asking you to review language we haven't written yet. I'm just asking whether the concept is okay with you. 
I mean, I think this is a really important issue. I think that kids being the victims of crimes in foster care is something that we all should take seriously. Mm -hmm. And so I would be happy to look at what you're interested in collecting data on and talk about it for sure. Okay. Getting on to your next question, though, when a child on child issue occurs in a foster care setting, um, it should be reported because everyone who works in these settings are mandated reporters under the social services law and that prompts an investigation um, by our Office of Special Investigations and then there's a child protective investigation that is conducted and then a determination is made as to whether that uh, investigation results in a finding of some credible evidence of abuse or maltreatment. And so there's an investigation. Uh, I'm also sure there's a, a fine line uh, in the child on child situation. Uh, uh, there may be, you know, maybe difficult even uh, to know when someone is with staff consenting well. and someone is. I mean, I just want to make clear that what happens in those situations. In any case, whether the whether there's a criminal investigation or not, there's there is a, a child protective investigation. Well, but uh, I was where I was going was that it, there may be activity that appears consensual, but really is more subject to peer pressure or bullying of some kind that is much more can be much more subtle. Um, the uh, uh, the other topic that Councilmember King touched on was the NYPD about four years ago. Um, we had a hearing um, where we had uh, someone from Dallas PD uh, participate and talked about, you know, what they do in Dallas, uh, which sounded strikingly progressive. Um, and uh, the question uh, I have, I assume that this interagency task force you described in your testimony, the NYPD sits on that? There's um, the Criminal Justice Coordinators Task Force that the NYPD is on, as well as ACS, as, as well as a lot of the provider agencies. The, the task force the Commissioner mentioned is a um, uh, more high-level task force um, that um, the Deputy Mayor runs. So there's different levels oh, of task on forces. On that high-level task force, we have the NYPD. Well, yes, yeah, she, she, okay. she, she does. Okay. She does. All right. So, so. Uh, uh, regardless of who runs it, um, it, it would strike me that a properly uh, and fully trained police force would be the best, well, not the best, but uh, a, a valuable supplement to any street outreach that we're able to fund. Uh, and I uh, just want to encourage you, uh, you know, to, to include them in. Cops see a lot of stuff that uh, our very, very limited street outreach team can, uh, can possibly get to. Uh, and certainly, uh, I assume, that their handbook, uh, you know, does tell them that when they pick up a 16-year-old or a 17-year-old, uh, and they know that they're 16 or 17 um, for street work, that they know right away they treat them as a victim and not as a criminal. I, I certainly hope that is happening. We, I mean, I, I, I want to say that we work very closely with the police department um, on our cases and. Uh, and you know, the the issue for us is always what's the best approach to the individual case that we're working on. And sometimes the police department can be very helpful in an in an investigation, depending on where we are. And other times that may not be the case. But we've had a very collaborative relationship with the police department in terms of some of the specific cases that our investigative consultants have been have been working on to sometimes very positive results for young people. Okay. Um, now let me follow up just on a question that uh, Councilmember Arroyo, uh, you know. Just kind of brought the topic up in general. Um, I, I know that um, in some studies that we've done of runaway and homeless youth, we've uh, you know had identifiers put in so we knew we weren't counting uh, the same person multiple times uh, without um, crossing the line of uh, disclosing their personal identities. Uh, in uh, intro 866A, uh, will you guys know whether or not the person that you're reporting uh, as having had contact with ACS is the same or different from someone who uh, had contact with DYCD? 
So um, part of the reason that we want to have somebody look at this, a consultant look at this, is that's one of the reasons that we're um, interested in, in, in that, that you raise one of the issues that we're, uh, that we're concerned. In other words, the quality of the data, um, because uh, young people sometimes um, use aliases our own systems sometimes don't capture information correctly. Um, this is, you know, this is an area around which we want to be cautious so that the data is actually uh, reliable. Well, so if if the, if the legislation were to uh, um, uh, use the word unique individuals um, or something like that and leave the process of uh, how you work towards making sure that those individuals are unique uh, without uh, disclosing their personal identity. That would, that would be something we could look at. Uh, but, I'm, but I'm also, um, you know, uh, more concerned uh, or as much concerned with knowing uh, which individuals have passed through both of your systems. I'm, I'm sure, uh, well, your predecessor would know that uh, I, I have certainly commented on the fact that uh, foster care is frequently uh, the biggest spigot uh, onto the run runaway and homeless youth population, are the kids aging out, or kids leaving, or kids uh, being driven out of their foster care home the same way they were driven out of their home. Um, so knowing, uh, you know, which of these individuals have been in contact with both of you, um, I, you know, I think the, the, the biggest tragedy of all would be someone who uh, does come into a DYCD street outreach program that's sent over to ACS, put into a foster care system, and gets abused there. Uh, that, that is just, you know, like double tragic. So uh, I think we, uh, we want to try and uh, work this bill to the point where uh, we can capture that data. Is that that's something you'd be happy to look at? Or? Okay. Yes. Yes. Terrific. Okay. Uh, Commission on the Sex Trafficking Desk Aid, um, the, the Sex Trafficking Resources for JCCA um, gateways. You, um, youth have to have referrals to enter these these programs. They they can just call up. So um, I think the answer to your question is yes. In other words, a worker needs to make a referral. Is that what you're asking? Yes. yes. And and is um, are the 12 beds that JCCA um, operate are they outside of the city? Yes. They, that, that yes, they're located outside the outside city. The, oh, why is that? Just so um, uh, JCCA, I think, uh, and I'm there. They would answer this question better than I would. I think that that's actually deliberate as part of their model. So help that, them. That there is a that there is a sense that uh, a, a geographic separation for this particular population helps the uh, process of recovery. Okay. All right. I just probably I because there's less of a temptation, and it makes it makes the the rehabilitation process um, easier in the beginning. I'm sure. Thank you. Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Chair. I'll make it real quick in the interest of time, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, in your testimony, I believe it's on page five, you spoke about um, the training uh, in respect to sexual exploitation and that there would be uh, training available for employees as well as the work with DYCD. The question I have for you, is there going to be availability of ongoing training throughout the year? Is there... Um, not just one training because models of behavior change, so on and so forth, and even approaches. Is that something that you would consider? Is there uh, an outside or maybe internal entity that trains employees ongoing when need be? For example, to identify different things in different populations. I mean, if they're all seasoned clinical people, but you still have to go for updates and you still have to stay in touch with new so I'm wondering, is that something that you've considered? So I, I want to say that our goal is to train trainers so that there can be ongoing training. Available uh, on site? Exactly. And that that will be an ongoing uh, capacity that we will build with this money so that we will continue to be able to do it at ACS going forward, not just this year, but going forward. 
Okay, so that those folks would have availability of other training. Correct. That they can come internally and train your team. Correct. And also the folks at DYCD, I would imagine it's the same thing. Right. We we also have uh, what we and what we will call program champions that we are going to. Uh, develop within the agency who will develop expertise in these issues so that we will have uh, knowledge, um, we will grow knowledge within ACS and those people will be required to become our, our, our subject matter experts in the agency um, and they will get significant training on these issues and um, we will have at least one in each division who, who will be the repository of these um, this information. Well, thank you. You answered both questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Council Member Burrow. Thank you. I'm sure you've probably traced this, but in that some young people may have been in school at one point, may still be in school, it's the same question I ask everybody, and you know probably what it is, but when are we ever going to get, and do you support culturally appropriate mental health services in the school so that these young people could perhaps have somebody to talk to so they don't end up. So how do we talk about prevention before we get in this situation and does that come up in your task force? How do we stop it? Would mentally health, mental health culturally appropriate services help in the schools and is anybody advocating for them except for me? Task force um, is very concerned uh, about the schools and there has been conversations about how to um, get some training to the teachers, training to the guidance counselors and there's work going on in, in that area. I mean, guidance counselors can't do it all. You need social workers to be honest with you. The guidance counselors are swamped. So could, would the discussion of what I just described come up maybe in the future? Yeah, we certainly will bring it back, but I'm, uh, it's, um, it is one of the areas that um, perhaps is the toughest to tackle, and the conversations are going on in the task force on that. I won't belabor it, but you get the point. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's a good point. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. Um, I can be sure that our uh, councils will be in touch with you about trying to uh, come to language that includes everything that needs to be included in, in a way that you can accept. I'd ask DYCD to, uh, as well to look at any programs within your regis other than uh, drop-ins, uh, crisis shelters and tills that it might be appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but I think, you know, if we can find some others, it would be great. And uh, I, I, I trust that uh, all four of you uh, will take back uh, to your uh, uh, to, to the, man, the Office of Management and Budget, the point about one-shot funding uh, and uh, how that doesn't work for our providers in RHY either. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we, have, we have three panels. Uh, unfortunately, we have to be out of this room at 1 o'clock. Uh, so um, I apologize for that. So I'm going to ask each of you, even though we don't actually have a physical clock in the room, uh, to go for about three minutes. Uh, please don't read your testimony. Just submit it. Uh, but just hit the high points for us. I think that would be uh, the most productive use of our time uh, because otherwise Barbara's going to come upstairs and kill us. Uh, so our first panel is um, Janice Holtzman from GEMS, um, Elizabeth Schnur from JCCA, and Camilla Tapellis from ECPAT USA. And we've been joined by Councilmember Mealy. In the interest of time, why don't you just jump in there and start, please? Because I want to give everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'd like to extend a thank you to the City Council for convening this hearing and an opportunity to testify about reporting data related to sexually exploited youth. Um, I'm Janice Holzman. I'm the Chief Development and Communications Officer at Girls Educational and Mentoring Services, GEMS. 
Um, I'm going to skip over our mission. I've got to, you know, cut the testimony down a little bit. So I think most people know what GEMS does. We serve girls between 12 and 24 who have been victims of commercial sexual exploitation. We're the largest agency of our kind in the United States, and we are the only nonprofit in New York uh, dedicated to serving this population exclusively. We were founded in 1998 by Rachel Lloyd, a survivor of commercial sexual exploitation. Well, we were going to skip over the uh, yeah, I, uh, CV. <laughs> okay. Um, of the 350 girls and young women GEM serves every year, approximately 75% have had some form of child welfare involvement. In calendar year 2012, we received a total of 57 housing referrals for the eight beds funded through DYCD. And that's just for our population that we serve under 21. We received a total of 74 housing referrals that year. We've witnessed a significant increase in public awareness over the last five years and a dramatic improvement in the city's response to the issue. But I think we all know that this is a pivotal moment and what we do at this moment is really going to impact how we address this issue going forward. Um, documenting the number of youth in contact with ACS is a great step forward. Um, training the staff, providing technical assistance, and supporting ACS in ongoing direct service work and crisis response service is something that GEMS has been doing for 10 years with ACS. Um, if documentation or counting is going to be required, the methodology is really critical. Um, Without survivor-informed support in developing the systems to gather this information, we're certain to miss youth. Only with survivor-led and informed support that service providers will be able to create an environment where young people feel that they can disclose a history of commercial sexual exploitation without experiencing stigmatization. Um, the, the proposal raised a few questions for GEMS. Um, obviously, where are the funds going to come from to pay for training of caseworkers? What's the cost associated with this? Um, does this really mean that hundreds of thousands of dollars designated for counting um, while direct services by providers um, go unfunded year after year? Does the count happen at initial intake? If so, do they go back afterwards to amend records? How does one achieve unduplicated accounts, which was mentioned, um, and will a young person's disclosure follow him or her through the system? What happens once someone is counted? Where is he or she referred? What services do they receive? And how are those services funded? And what about youth who are already counted? As I mentioned, GEM serves a significant number of ACS-involved young people. Where is the support to serve those who are already in services and need food, transportation, shelter? At this time, there are still no designated crisis beds for commercially sexually exploited youth in New York City. Most critically, are the services going to be in line with survivor-informed models? While there's no evidence-based models, there are survivor-led models that work and have documented successes, like My Life, My Choice in Boston, Missy in Oakland, California. We can't emphasize enough that survivor leadership is critical in the creation and the development of implementation of services. And GEMS' own survivor-led training, Victim Survivor Leader, is being trained on all over the country, but not in New York City, except for external service providers. Um, Separate but related, we're focusing a lot of energy on this aspect of it, but what's happening to the boys who are in the system? And not just those who need services, but how are we helping young men not become exploiters themselves who are ACS involved? Um, in order to gather information that's accurate, city agencies will need widespread training and technical assistance um, to, to develop a supportive and judgment-free environment throughout youth services to create an environment where young people do feel like they can disclose this information. ACS needs a tolerance policy um, beyond a resource guide that would, you know, reflect appropriate language. Education on the issue that's beyond uh, caseworkers and administration believing that young people would like to do this or actually enjoy commercial sexual exploitation and understand that a young person with a trafficker does not have access to money and that the opportunity to go out to dinner probably means a trip to McDonald's. They also need materials um, that are available to young people that are youth friendly, that will create an environment and a culture where it is okay to share this information. Because the idea that a young person is going to share this information to someone they've just met is really unrealistic. We appreciate the urgency to bring this issue to the, or to the forefront and to start documenting the scale of it. Um, at GEMS, we've been waiting for this kind of acknowledgement for a long time. But we need to slow this process down. 
and bring major stakeholders, not simply as part-time case managers, but as leaders, to create, an, to create a system that young people will benefit from. Survivors are being left out of this conversation. There are no magic questions you can ask that are going to ensure a young person will disclose a history of abuse to someone they've just met. An answer of yes will likely mean yes, but a response of no is by no means a definitive no. If we start this project without survivor input, we run the risk of developing a system that misses the majority of exploited youth and creates a false perception that there isn't a problem. We would caution against focusing so closely on counting that youth aren't being served or aren't being served well. That's why we're all here, and the young people need to remain central to this conversation. Thank you again. Thank you. And before we go to the next uh, witness, I just want to point out that uh, I think everyone who is familiar with this is aware of the fact that whatever numbers come out of this will be an undercount. Right. It's obvious to, to anyone who's been working on this problem for five minutes. Um, the, the motivation behind this bill is to establish empirically the, in, the inadequacy of services for this, continuum, this population. That's the point. Um, because, you know, I can get anecdotal testimony from any provider about the length of their waiting list, um, but we will never move beyond the service capacity that we have now, particularly with the ridiculous funding that we get from the state um, and, and the virtual absence of funding from the federal government, uh, to, be, you know, to, to meet the, the actual need unless we can prove it. And that's the point. So, next, please. Is that better? Don't, please don't read Okay, the I thank you all. Place. You're all wonderful for supporting this important initiative. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to try and skip about the agency. You've heard a lot about our programs, um, our Gateways program, which actually now, because of the expansion with NSP, is um, serving 19 uh, young women. Um, at a time, so um, or can that's our capacity. So um, the continued need for services with this population obviously can't be overstated. The Justice Department estimates that there are between 100,000 and 3 million adolescents who are sex sexually exploited each year in this country, and um, I want to point out that this huge range in the estimate—that's like as I'm a researcher, and that's like a ridiculous range—and um, I think that's a really a good indicator of why this kind of en enterprise is important to get some kind of uh, estimate, better estimate of what, what the problem is and what it looks like. Um, just 16% uh, of the girls in JCCA's Gateways program are under the age of 14, and we have served girls as young as 11 in this program. Um, so um, I'm not going to tell you about my credentials. I'm a researcher. I just want to put that out there because um, what, I, what I mostly want to say is um, some concerns we have and some recommendations we have about how the data are collected. And um, so first, um, we want to encourage whomever, ACS um, and NYPD, uh, in collecting the data to consider the individuals who are going to provide the information. Um, the service line staff members are often the ones we go to and they're the ones who are the most overtaxed with work. So to the extent that we have existing data, it would be really good to mine that data for um, the kind of information we need. Um, and um, as my colleague pointed out, they will need technical assistance, um, whomever is, uh, are the people to whom we're going. Um, I think I agree with you that we need to consult with a large set of stakeholders, um, including staff at direct service organizations who are working with these young people, um, researchers to help really understand how um, you get an accurate estimate, um, representatives from juvenile justice, and um, the youth themselves um, to create a thoughtful and meaningful data collection tool and ensure appropriate sampling. And the sampling question is a huge one, so um, that's why you need researchers. Um, it's um, obviously inadequate to collect data based solely on youth who have been referred for services specific specifically for this population. Given the dearth of programs both citywide and nationwide, this will necessarily result in an undercount. 
Um, many youth also present signs of CSEC involvement well after initial intake. I think this was part of what your point was. Um, so suggesting that an initial screening tool when people come in the front door, which I heard some discussion of, um, will, um, it will yield significant underestimates of prevalence. It's really a, a problematic way to go. Um, perhaps more importantly, we believe that the greatest number of youth involved in CSEC um, are not easily identifiable and will not self-identify and also are represented in a large range of non-specialized, non-referred settings, including schools. Um, many youth involved in CSEC are invisible and unknown to any law enforcement or child welfare systems, but they were the ones who ultimately will come into the systems. So um, we need to think about how these tools will engage and count youth who exist outside these systems. For example, although JCCA runs programs specifically for CSEC survivors, a recent quick survey of staff in our agency programs that do not explicitly serve this population demonstrated the presence of a, a fairly large number of children whom staff strongly suspect have been or, have been or are currently involved in CSEC activity. Um, we also need to understand that there's not a defined set of standards or symptoms to identify a youth who has been involved with commercial sexual exploitation. This term covers a spectrum of experience and needs and we need to clarify what is actually included. Um, rather than lumping everybody together. Similarly, when developing estimates, we need to be clear that we are all using the same criteria to define this population. For example, although many young people involved in commercial sexual exploitation have also been sexually abused, these terms are not synonymous and have different treatment implications, really different treatment implications. And um, I can just tell you that um, we, our, our campus in Westchester County has um, about 250 young people on it. Um, I would estimate 80% of them have experienced sexual ex abuse. Um, a much smaller number are, have been involved or are involved in sexual exploitation. So just um, so we need to address the fact that the populations of sexually exploited youth may vary dramatically in terms of identification and treatment need, and ideally the data will reflect this diversity. Uh, the trajectory and needs of boys and young men who are sexually exploited and other people of races uh, may differ dramatically we believe they do from those of girls and young women and age is an important variable as well we've seen in our own program that working with 11 and 12 and 13 year olds is very different than working with uh, the 16 15 16 year olds um, uh, the more we are able to accurately characterize the population um, in the estimates the more we ultimately will be able to target effective interventions. And I really want to stress interventions because there's a lot of, con a lot of discussion about identifying the kid, finding the problem, and then there's not a lot of treatment, specialized treatment out there um, designed to work with this population. And um, generic therapy, generic um, you know, counseling does not, is not an effective tool. Which is why the funding of the Safe, Safe Harbor Act at the level that it's being funded at is so exactly. outrageous. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, so, uh, I have to ask you to sum up, though. I'm sorry. Beg pardon? I have to ask you to sum up. I'm sorry. I'm summing up. I, I'm done. Um, basically, uh, we want to reiterate our enthusiastic support for data collection and um, encourage the City Council to use this information to support direct service and specialized treatment to this population. Uh, the most immediate way to help this population is to get youth off the street and into crisis beds, of which there are shamefully few in the city, and to provide them with specialized treatment, which is even scarcer. Thank you for your interest um, in the issue, and we look forward to working together. And I just want to add really quickly, if anybody wants me to talk a little bit about gateways and why it makes sense for it not to be in the city, I would be happy to do that, um, but I'll wait until someone... Do that asks. offline. <laughs> okay. May? Yeah. Uh, hello, good morning. Many thanks to Council Member Fiddler and Palma for convening this important um, hearing. Uh, ECPAT USA um, is a 22-year-old agency, international, um, known for um, working exclusive, exclusively on protecting children from sexual exploitation. We carried out over the last 22 years research advocacy for policy and legislative changes and implemented a wide range of programs to protect sexually exploited children in New York and nationally. We also work closely with the private sector, especially the travel industry, to implement corporate policies to ensure travel businesses are not facilitating willingly or unwillingly, child sexual exploitation on their premises. Lack of adequate 
accurate and current information. I, I, I apologize, but I have to ask you not to read two pages. I will not. Points. Just I will skip half of Thank it. You. Do not worry. <laughs> um, lack of adequate information is often referred to as a reason why existing child protection laws and related child welfare services are insufficiently funded. ECPAT USA expresses its strong support for the proposed local law 0886 that would request ACS to submit yearly reports to the City Council documenting the number of sexually exploited children. In 2008, ECPAT USA actively advocated for New York Safe Harbor Law aimed to protect minors victims of sexual exploitation from criminal prosecution and ensuring specialized services for them. Since its enactment in New York in 2010, based on ACS information, as of November 2012, 29 minors have been processed as trafficking victims in the state. Several loopholes and weaknesses of Safe Harbor became apparent. Failure of accurately identifying victims still remains a primary barrier and I think ACS in their testimony um, explained what they will do to address this matter. Um, a very important point from the ECPAT USA point of view is that although federal legislation defines all children younger than 18 years old as trafficking victims in need of protection, New York State law enforcement and courts still identify children younger than 18 as delinquent prostitutes, considering them criminals instead of routing them on a rehabilitative child welfare course. There is no minimum age for arresting a child for prostitution in New York, which makes it possible for exploited children 14, 15 years old and sometimes younger to be detained for a crime for which they technically have no capacity to consent to. Based on these considerations, ECPAT USA would like to convey to New York City Council its strong support for the proposed local law. 0886 to improve accountability and support better informed decision-making policies to protect children in New York. A request to pass a resolution in support of the recently introduced New York State Pauline Lanza Bill, Trafficking Victims Protection and Justice Act that will support correcting an important problem in safe harbor legislation the, that the criminal justice system still treats 16 and 17 year old victims as criminal defend, defendants, not as victims of trafficking. Support to increase funding for available specialized services to commercially sex, sexually exploited children and in particular long-term safe housing options. We would also like to call for the City Council support to, raise the, to the Raise the Age Legislative Initiative of New York Chief Judge Liebman to raise the age of criminal liability in the state of New York from 16, as it currently is, to 18. New York is one of the last two states in the country that did not yet reform its juvenile justice system to this effect. This change, although it will likely involve a long-term phase implementation process, will also address implicitly important gaps in protection of all youth under 18 years old from all forms of sexual exploitation. Once again, many thanks from MECPAT USA to the New York City Council Committee for Youth Services and General Welfare um, for the opportunity given to us for testifying to this hearing. We, of course, remain available to you for further information. One final note, we are in the process of compiling a study specifically um, uh, exploring the situation of boys in commercial sexual exploitation of children. There is a stark lack of awareness and services at all levels, both in government as well as for city um, providers that the, this is a population that is currently um, unaddressed and just lives in the shadows. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and again, the, the point of the, the bill, I mean, we know that, um, you know, the data that's being collected is going to represent probably even a small percentage of the actual uh, number of, uh, of young people that are involved. Uh, and the, the concept here would be that the bill uh, would require uh, the two agencies to uh, collaborate on regulations, not only to, the, to add, answer some of the questions you've raised about definitions, uh, but also process. Uh, and, and obviously, it would be our hope that they would be in, content, in you know, consultation with, with people like you. So uh, that, you know, the, the issues and difficulties that you all see could be addressed uh, in that way. I don't think it's something that would be appropriate to, to micromanage in the bill itself. Mm -hmm. but, okay. Question? One quick question. Um, the 19 beds currently run by JCCA, the expansion, is, are, those, are all the beds contracted by ACS or only the 12 that the Commissioner spoke about in his testimony? Um, 
Actually, I think it's 13 um, that are the initial contract. Uh, that, those are the NSP beds, the non-secure um, placement beds, uh, the additional six beds. So those are um, OCFS that were transferred to ACS beds. Yeah. So all the answer is yes, they're all ACS. All, all 19. Um, uh, we have the capacity to take a few more youth, and not, all, not every youth is um, necessarily ACS, but the majority are. Some come, we have, I think, one um, from Westchester DSS. The what, cap, I, number, you said we have the capacity, the capacity to take a few more. What's that few more number? Oh, well, it, uh, in one of the, the cottage that we specialize for NSP, it's really uh, licensed for 12. Um, right now, we're limiting it to six as we roll out the NSP and we keep that population separate. But ultimately, when we're able to mix populations, we can probably expand the capacity there. And the, and the new expansion to address the need in, in the male population um, who are sexually exploited, how, um, what will be the increase or, or what will be the capacity for the male population? Um, so we don't currently have uh, a contract or a plan for a residential program for young men. Uh, that population we will be serving in our foster, specialized foster care program. Um, and it's really, we're rolling it out now and we're learning and we're very excited to learn about your study um, because there's just so little information out there. Um. So there won't be n n no dedicated beds for the male population, just um, out in the specialized foster care, there are 24 beds. They are not uh, specialized uh, male or female. It's whomever needs, needs them, whoever is referred. We'll take both males and females and transgender and anyone else who uh, needs the service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me call up our, uh, we have two more panels. First is uh, Safe Horizons. Uh, we have uh, John Welch and Carolyn Shredwick. You know, I, I know, like, and, and, and you and those of you who are waiting to testify are like our go-to people. I just really apologize. So, thanks. There we go. Okay. Um, hi, I'd like to thank the committee for hearing my testimony today. Um, I'm John Welch, Senior Director at, uh, at Streetwork, a Safe Horizon program for homeless youth, including shelter, outreach, and drop-in centers. Um, we support the effort to collect data on sexually exploited youth and also wanted to offer some cautions. Um, through working closely with homeless youth for nearly three decades, we've learned that youth without appropriate shelter enter the sex trade. Too often the only alternative to, say, spending a night on the subway illegally is to sleep with someone in exchange for a place to stay. We know that young people are asking for more options because we are the ones they're asking. We know that they're looking for voluntary, accessible emergency shelter beds because we have a, late, a waiting list full of names. We believe that the first step to addressing this issue is to listen to the young people most impacted by it and to respond to their self-identified needs. The first thing that needs to be said is that there's no typical experience of the sex trade or profile of youth engaged in the sex trade. We know this population includes youth of all genders, sexual orientations, races, ethnicities, citizenship statuses, ages, and family backgrounds. It can be very challenging to learn whether our clients have been sexually exploited. There are many reasons for this. Young people choose, choose not to disclose because they have too often had experience of being judged for their decisions and circumstances, even by well-meaning service providers. As with survivors of all kinds of abuse, young people frequently internalize feelings of shame and that also stands in the way of their sharing their experiences. Many young people fear that if they disclose, Child Protective Services or the police will get involved and they may be returned to a placement they don't consider safe or welcoming or they may even be arrested. In fact, young people are so reluctant to become involved with ACS and it, that those who are under 18 years, years of age will often lie about their ages in order to access services or even decline service options such as shelter that might lead to ACS involvement. Also, youth do not trust that their disclosure will lead to helping them get what they truly need, jobs, shelter, housing, and mental health care. These are the things that can pull people out of the sex trade. Over the past few decades, our work in engaging and providing services to vulnerable youth has taught us that youth need room to discuss their ongoing struggles without feeling that they have failed or fearing that they could, loo uh, that they could lose access to services. 
We found that by creating a safe and supportive environment, we can build trust with our clients and over time learn more about their experiences. Our client-centered practice, including safety assessment, risk management, and a non-judgmental approach, promotes safety, increases options, builds trust, creates dialogue, and helps young people make safer choices for themselves. We acknowledge from the very outset that our clients are the experts in their own experiences, and we find that when a relationship is built on trust, our clients are more likely to feel a sense of ownership on their own path to safety. This is our critical point. We wish to caution the Council, as well as our partners at DYCD and ACS, against data collection strategies that place too much reliance on initial screening of young people before trust has, in, has been built. Um, and also in the, absence of, in the absence of critical concrete resources. This may have the unintended consequence of driving young people away from the very programs that are designed to help them by forcing them an to answer intrusive questions before they're ready. We agree, that the, um, we agree with the Council that there's a pressing need to learn more about the prevalence and, and impact of sexual exploitation on the city's youth and we hope to see city government utilizing such information to create more comprehensive plans to meet the needs of young people who are at risk. We would advise the city council to proceed with care and caution, securing advice from experts and from service providers who work with this population to ensure that the data collected is sound and that the process for collecting it does not inadvertently harm the very young people we all hope to aid. Thank you again for inviting us to testify. Thank you. you only one of you testifying? Yep. Oh, okay. Well, someone else on the panel. Questions? No, thank you. And uh, I've you know, read through your entire testimony, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our last panel, uh, Margo Hirsch from the Empire State Coalition, uh, Stephanie Gandell from the City's Citizens Committee for Children, and Catherine Mullen from uh, the Legal Aid Society. Thank you all, and I again apologize for rushing you and making you wait. Thank you for these hearings once again. Um, I don't have formal testimony. I'm just going to just uh, actually respond to some of what was said earlier because I had some major questions and concerns. Um, the money that was provided for Safe Harbor, $1.5 million, about a third of it, a little less than a third of it, went to IOFA for training and planning. So I don't understand why the city is spending some of their very precious money to duplicate those services. IOFA got somewhere between 380000 and 450000 to develop a curriculum, to do training. They only have to do training in nine counties. Five of them are New York City. So you're talking about a very small number of um, geographic areas where they have to do this training, and yet the city is spending some of their $600,000 for training. In addition, Safe Horizon does training for ACS all the time through their Rescue and Restore. So there's money that's already here that's going for training. So I would uh, request that that be looked into to see why we're not funding services. We desperately need services. Which brings me to crisis care, crisis residential services. When there was a meeting with OCFS about planning for safe harbor funds, the biggest need was crisis residential care for minors. DYCD seemed to indicate that if they get a 15-year-old who comes and needs a, a crisis placement that their only options are to call the parent or to call ACS. There is nothing, there is absolutely nothing in New York State law or federal law that would preclude DYCD to provide services for minors in a crisis shelter. The law is very clear that minors can access shelter at any age. I was under the impression that our providers already are doing that. I was a little surprised by her answer. Who? That our providers, our DYCD providers, are already providing shelter to children Not for 15-year-olds. The only, the only DYCD funding is for 16 to 21-year-olds. Okay. So there's, there's the so possibility... They, so, so her answer was accurate below the age of 16. 
but not well, above. CD said uh, if a fi the question was about a 15-year-old, so a 15-year-old. Okay. Right. And we know that young people, if they, you know, a lot of young people run away from foster care. They, they try to access services at a runaway and homeless youth program. They should be able to have that opportunity. We need to serve young people at the places where they choose to be served, at those places where they feel most comfortable, where they can get the best service. So the fact that DYCD has opted not to provide funding for a, a shelter for minors, and it can only be a 30-day shelter for the minors, um, but that that opportunity is there for them and that's a critical opportunity especially when you're looking at young people who um, need to get off the streets as quickly as possible with with the least bureaucratic red tape as possible to get them off the streets and that is the runaway and homeless youth system and if a young person has left foster care they've left foster care they're not going to necessarily go back there right away willingly so that was my second point from from the testimony today. Um, Covenant House has done a study. I know nobody from Covenant House is here today, unfortunately, because Jane Biggleson is, has not been well. But I think it's imperative that um, this committee look at that study and look at the findings in terms of who is being uh, sexually exploited uh, in the runaway and homeless youth system, the numbers. Uh, they did a study, a blind study of 200 young people, um, and 50% of them were male, 50% of them female, more or less. About 15% of their um, young people were being exploited. Most of them began, were first victimized over the age of 18, which is very different than what we hear about. So I think the fact that Safe Harbor does not provide funding and services for the 18 to 21 year old population is, is problematic because we really need to make sure. They don't sure provide funding for services for the people under 18 either, so what's the difference? Oh. I mean, and I, I just, you know, I, I mean, I know I'm breaking my own rule here, right. uh, but, uh, you know, I, I was concerned that they were using money for training and they were really supplanting their own agency budget. But when you get down to it, if you just take the street outreach van and staff for another street outreach van, which we all agree is necessary, we're probably talking about four hundred thousand dollars over over a year. Mm -hmm. Now that's not, you know enough money not to want to waste it, right? But it's not enough money to to open up shelter beds, not not in any significant way. So uh, you know that that's why the gross inadequacy of this fund. I mean, it's almost a joke to have a, a discussion about it uh, in the overall scheme of things. So I'm sorry for blurting that out, but I couldn't help myself. No, that's fine because I, I, I agree there needs to be a more comprehensive plan that looks at not just safe harbor funding. I think that safe harbor funding probably will get restored, but it's not going to get restored to the levels that is needed, especially when you're looking at this is a statewide issue with statewide funding 1.5. This is not all city money by any means. Um, and then the fact that, no, as Janice um, brought up, nobody talked about survivor-led services. I mean, that has been a critical element in all of the programs that have been effective. So when they talk about training, uh, training of staff, training of, of these new, you know, investigators, what they're not looking at is that resource within their own services that really could be critical to to helping young people disclose and to ask for services and to get those services. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephanie Gendel, the Associate Executive Director for Policy and Government Relations at Citizens Committee for Children. We want to thank the Council both for your continued interest in this issue and for introducing Intro 866A. Um, CCC is generally supportive of the introduction. As you noted, knowing how many New York City children and youth have been sexually exploited will help agencies like ACS, DYCD, the City Council, policymakers and advocates know how much resources we need and what to advocate for. While we're generally supportive of the legislation, we also strongly believe meeting the needs of these vulnerable youth needs more than tracking and reporting. Notably, we need services and we need to make sure the tracking and reporting is done in a way that protects the safety of the young people. With regard to services, I'm not going to reiterate, a lot of people have already talked about that, just to mention that we also agree we need more services for girls as well as for boys. Um, 
In addition, if we're going to do a lot of training to ensure that, young, that the staff coming into contact with these young people are able to better talk to them about how to disclose, then we need to have services available after they disclose or it's, we've actually made probably gone negative. Um, second, not all of the young people who are sexually exploited will present themselves at ACS or DYCD, so I think we need a more citywide way of tracking and finding these young people. Um, Next, when we do the tracking, we need to make sure that we protect the safety of the young people. Um, there's a lot of sensitivity in these cases, and there's a potential danger to the children and youth if their identities become known. Um, so we would be okay if the tracking was not 100% accurate in the sake of safety of the child. Um, and lastly, I wanted to talk about the state. Um, the funding for Safe Harbor has been a long and arduous battle, in part due to the state's fiscal problems. We've gone from um, an alleged, a cut from the $10 million to $3 million that was then never spent. Um, then we went down to $0, and then we got $1.5 million, and now um, we're once again back where we're going to have $0. OCFS, as we've talked about, has decided to spend about $500,000 on a contract with IOFA, um, which is a statewide cross-system training package. According to OCFS, OF IOFA participated in building and implementing this model in Illinois. The OCFS contract is supposed to include training for participants such as child welfare professionals, law enforcement, mental health professionals, and the development of a toolkit tailored to New York, which would include screening and assessment tools. IOFA would then be conducting an evaluation of the proje project. The city is also then planning to use some of their money on training and better ensuring that their staff are able to identify these young people. So one of our concerns is at the end of all of this training, we will have identified a significant number of young people that we will not have any services to provide to them. Um, we are then very concerned about losing the $1.5 million that we've received from the state for this one year. And so we're asking respectfully, given the council's interest in commercially sexually exploited youth, that the council reach out to your counterparts in the state in your state budget advocacy package or write a letter or take what other steps might be necessary on your behalf to help these young people. Thank you. Uh, we, we, we have done that and we will and we continue to. My concern is that uh, uh, Amy Paul and Assemblywoman Paul is no longer the chair. Uh, and I think she was probably responsible for getting the funding in the first place. Yep. That's why I, uh, when I screamed on her Facebook page when she took another committee. Thank you, Chairs Fiddler and Palmer. My name is Catherine Mullen. I'm an attorney with the Juvenile Rights Practice of the Legal Aid Society, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. I've provided written testimony, and I won't go over the points that I made in the testimony, uh, but I do want to raise one nightmare scenario that I think is very important to keep in mind. The family court is not just a place where services are provided, it's a place of litigation. And when you have child protective proceedings, you have the city as a party, you have parent or guardian as a party, you have the child as a party. When you have a PINS proceeding, you have a parent as a party and you have a child as a party. ACS case records are discoverable in these proceedings. The worst thing in the world would be for some vulnerable child to make a disclosure to somebody uh, that they have been sexually exploited and have that appear in a case record that then is used in the subject of litigation. Well, so that, that wouldn't be the case if we used identifiers that protected their... Uh, their, their I, I would hope... That, that we're able to identify them as individuals but not who the individuals are. I think that it's going to be a very difficult protocol to manage, both respecting uh, anonymity and not identifying people, yet making sure that referrals and services are made available to people who have disclosed that they have been sexually exploited. So, uh, and, and in terms of that protocol, I would again reiterate what has been said several times, uh, that th this must be survivor informed. The voices of youth must be heard in this process. And it is an extraordinarily difficult conversation to have with a young person discussing whether or not they've been sexually exploited. And the people who can best inform a protocol for that are the young people. And one example is the Victim Survivor Leadership Manual that's been developed by the GEMS program that was uh, the voices of youth are included and wrote that manual. There are other tools available and I would urge uh, the City Council to endorse including the voices of youth in developing this protocol. The big danger, um, as you've said, Chair Fiddler, over and over again, is there are going to be underreporting. There's no way that this can be an accurate number. And then somehow having that number tied to the provision of services uh, would be a disservice to the youth. 
you know, the, the, uh, the issue of not identifying the individual, of being able to count the individuals specifically, uh, has been something that, uh, you know, we've grappled with and, and, uh, has, and, and somewhat successfully, I, I believe. Um, but I, I would just ask you this question. If someone is in a PINs proceeding, all right, and someone somehow gets from ACS the fact that we're about to return a young person to a home where they're being sexually exploited, don't you think that should be made aware regardless of whether or not the young person is particularly happy about the fact that mommy or daddy or Uncle Joe is abusing them in that household? I think that that's a, a different discussion because then they would be subjects of uh, an abuse proceeding, a, a child abuse proceeding, that they wouldn't be in a, in a PINS proceeding. Unfortunately, most frequently, the youth are being sexually exploited have come from ACS care themselves. Uh, oh, yeah, I know that. And, and, and most frequently, um, parents and guardians come in and file PINS petitions and they, they suspect there might be a problem. The problem isn't in their home, it's, it's what's going on outside of their home. Um, I, I do think ACS misses an opportunity when parents come in and file PINS petitions and children are missing, that they don't start working with the parents right away to train them on that issue. I, I asked the question really only to point out the, the fact that there is, uh, a, you know, it is a much, it's, it's even more complicated than we've discussed because whether it's ACS, uh, you know, wherever the household is, um, you have to balance the child's right not to disclose it with the fact that not disclosing it may be harmful to their health. And, um, you know, they may not think it's a good idea to say, gee, don't send me back to that foster care facility. Someone there is abusing me with the fact that maybe they're wrong and they really need to disclose it because you don't want to send them right back uh, t into that hell. So, uh, you know, I don't think this bill really deals with that, but, I, you know, I just I don't, I don't want to leave it out there that, that, that you know, the idea of, uh, of letting a child not say that they're being sent back to an abuser um, is a good thing. So, um, anybody have any questions? Closing statement? No? I just um, want, again, to reiterate the importance of, of, this, um, of this bill, and thank you once again, uh, Mr. Chair, for um, putting this piece of legislation um, together. I hope that we can bring it to a vote really soon. Um, it's not going to get us to where I think we need to be in terms of services and really getting the real number of children who are being abused, but I think, you know, um, getting the agencies used to at least start tracking um, the, these children that have been sexually exploited is, is a really um, important first step um, which will enable us then to discuss um, and have further discussion for greater funding to provide these kinds of services to really ensure that this doesn't continue to happen. Thank you. And I, uh, first, I want to thank you, too, uh, Chairwoman Palmer. This bill came from a prior joint uh, committee hearing uh, with General Welfare, uh, and you've been, uh, you and the General Welfare Committee have been fabulous partners in, in some of this uh, stuff, most of this stuff. Um, uh, you know, clearly, there is some work that needs to be done on this bill to make sure that it, it hits the right note. Uh, I've been talking to counsel uh, throughout the hearing about some of the points that you've all made. Uh, we'll try and, and, uh, and balance them um, up to the point of, of regulation, because I think at that point the agencies have to be responsible, and I think you'll, uh, you'll all make yourselves heard uh, on that. Um, the, uh, the fact of the matter is, and I'll reiterate this as a conclusion, is that the purpose of this bill is to give all of us, you over there and us over here, uh, the weapons that we need to fight uh, for more adequate funding because the funding levels, uh, either at Safe Harbor or RHY or uh, any of these things, are, are so grossly inadequate that they're shameful. And, uh, you know, it, it appears that we, uh, we fight over and over again for the same ground. And uh, I am going to uh, wrap the words of Commissioner Richter around uh, Mark Page's head uh, on this issue of uh, baselining the RHY funding. I hope you'll all uh, be there for that, uh, that, that fight, that argument. I think it's critically important uh, this year. And I mean, fact of the matter is we should be getting more funding and baselining that. But, you know, not wanting to be a pig, I'll settle for uh, baselining what we have at very least. So uh, I thank you all for your help. I thank uh, staff of both committees for their work. And with that, I uh, adjourn this hearing. I think we made the 1 o'clock deadline. 101. All right. 101. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think so. <laughs>